So good morning everybody and uh, welcome to this event on measuring progress towards the Paris Agreement, aligning policy and science and global stock dates. Um, I wasn't going to do introductions, but as we haven't got the main cards here, I'll just say briefly who we are. But I would like to uh, introduce uh, the person to my right, Mr. Pabayan Botsama, who's standing in for the Minister of Botswana. He's the uh, Deputy Permanent Secretary, Minister of the Environment, Natural Resources, Conservation and Tourism, and also focal points on climate change. And uh, some of you may know that next year, Botswana will be hosting um, the IPCC authors doing the 1.5 degree report. So thank you, thank you very much for being here. So Mr. Botswana will begin by giving a, a framing statement. Um, and the other people uh, we have here, um, Mr. Miles Allen from the University of Oxford, uh, Dr. Um, Keith Shine, Professor uh, Keith Shine from the University of Reading, and Dr. Jan Fugusha from Cicero. Um, this issue of measuring progress under the Paris Agreement, I guess sometimes when we get talking about measuring gases and metrics, it sounds very, I guess very technical and, and the policy people are not usually experts in atmospheric physics and radiative forcing and yet there, there are very important policy implications for um, the choice of these metrics and particularly for how goals are translated into action. Now we have used the metric of global or a 100 year global warming potential uh, satisfactorily in the Kyoto Protocol, but now that we have the Paris Agreement in place, uh, it does seem timely to review uh, the way that we measure the gases. We now have goals that are new and clearer, 2 degrees, 1.5 degrees, the concept of a balance between uh, sources and sinks, and of course, secondly, the, the Paris Agreement is very long-term, multi-decadal looking potentially towards the end of the century compared with the rather short term of the um, protocol. I think one point that has always been made about uh, measurement is that no single metric is going to be perfect. One issue that has come up though in, these, in the research that has been done since the PWP 100 was adopted is the issue of uh, have we got it right in regard to short lifetime gases and the relationship between them and long lifetime gases. There has been one issue where the, where the question of alignment with policy has, has been raised and we will be talking about that in the course of this event and using CO2 as the long lifetime gas and methane as the short lifetime gas. And of course that does have fairly major implications for countries uh, like Botswana and like New Zealand who have a large agriculture sector. Um, in terms of the, what one is looking for in the metric, clearly one that is aligned with the goals as closely as possible, uh, one that can help us to track progress, uh, one that is also workable and as simple as possible. Also I think important when um, many countries were looking towards economic instruments to ensure their transitions to low carbon or net zero or whatever we call it as part of the global transition. If you're using economic instruments, you really want to make sure that you have the correct weightings applied to uh, the different gases. Also, questions of how you treat gases. Is it um, going to be possible and under the Paris Agreement to keep the idea of a basket of gases for a single uh, accounting measure? Or would you need to separate the gases out? Important also, I think, for what will be many burden sharing discussions when countries compare and contrast their progress uh, moving towards the, the goals of the Paris Agreement. So that's a sort of general framing of our, of our session here. So we'll begin with um, uh, an introduction uh, from Botswana, and then the next presenter will be Miles Allen, who will talk about. Uh, global, current global warming trends and the implications uh, of those for the Paris uh, temperature goals. Then Keith Shine, what will be the, the most, um, I guess, the, long, the longest part of his presentations, will look at trying to assess the metric, um, which is, but it won't be too long because it will be cut off as he goes at a time, but um, it'll, it'll look at trying to try and assess the metric that, that we think might be best aligned uh, with the goals of the Paris Agreement. 
um, and we'll be looking at whether the GWP can be adjusted uh, and rather than throwing it out completely, can be adjusted to provide a, um, a better alignment. Uh, and then finally, uh, Young Foolstuff will return to the Paris Agreement, look at some of the wording in that Paris Agreement and the goals in the Paris Agreement and, and look at how they might need to be interpreted. For example, the question of balance, what exactly does it mean? Uh, in a sense, the problem there, I think, that one faces is that it wasn't scientists who put those words together, it was negotiators making compromises and the way that negotiators make compromises is always leading to, it always has, it is through constructive ambiguity. So there's, um, there'll be some reflection there on, okay, how do, how do the science and the policy people work together just to work out what exactly it is we need to achieve under the Paris goals? And again, that links back to the, the fundamental question of the, of, of the, of the core measurement. Um, at the end of the session, we'll just talk a little bit about some of the other material that we have prepared as a policy brief, and uh, we'll, sure, we hope there'll be a, a, an article in a, in a Sunday journal which will make this case rather more and rather more depth than, than it can be today. But I think without further ado, I should uh, now turn over the floor for our introduction from Mr. Bossano from Botswana. Over to you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Botswana did participate in the negotiations prior to the uh, COP21, that is in Paris, uh, related to the historic agreement, uh, the Paris Agreement, December 2015. Um, what is key in the Paris Agreement is that uh, we need to ensure that the implementation mechanisms are informed by lessons learned from the Kyoto Protocol. Um, Therefore, that will lead us to ensure that there is progressive and sustainable uh, means of implementation that will serve the interest of all parties uh, to the agreement. I think the NDC is a good uh, point to start. However, for countries like Botswana, there is a need to uh, get the means um, of support availed as soon as possible because in order for us to start implementing and uh, ensuring that uh, there is an initial review that can guide us whether we are on the right trajectory or not uh, in terms of delivering the aspirations of the ambitious um, Paris Agreement. Remember, Paris Agreement, the target is three degrees Celsius with that ambitious uh, uh, target of 1.5 degrees Celsius. But for countries like Botswana, they have already exceeded the 1.5 degrees Celsius. And you are looking at something like four to five degrees Celsius uh, in the long run. So it's important for us that uh, this agreement uh, is uh, implemented so that we don't go beyond uh, the, the, the high temperatures of five degrees Celsius and so forth. Uh, the reality on the ground is that uh, in terms of capabilities, we have different capabilities uh, to undertake national adaptation and uh, mitigation response measures. And uh, therefore, there should be differentiation uh, at the center of allocation of means of support. Uh, be it finance or technology, we do need uh, that support. Um, Botswana is currently guided by uh, two documents on top of the uh, Paris Agreement. We have the Vision 2036 and the National Development Plan 11. Uh, we were fortunate that uh, the uh, Paris Agreement just came before the development of these two documents, and therefore we are able to infuse it into our national development uh, amendment plan, and therefore it's easier to take it forward uh, and implement some of the uh, 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 commitments that we have under the Paris Agreement. Uh, these documents are spoke about are both uh, anchored on sustainable development, and the development attempt to mainstream climate change into all development priorities was made. Uh, delivering on the sustainable development pathway will automatically deliver a sound climate change agenda that contributes to the global uh, effort. Um, what we have been with the ground currently is that uh, we have already started uh, to move away a bit from coal. Uh, Botswana is endowed with a lot of coal, uh, and we are still uh, uh, discovering more coal fuels. Uh, however, we are aware that uh, if we have to be part of the uh, 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 
rest of the world, we need to move away from the accord. And um, we are currently working on putting up the 300 megawatts uh, solar power plant uh, in the, within the next five years, uh, which will certainly go uh, a long way in producing the uh, 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 electricity generated from uh, coal. Um, we are also finalizing a strategy on uh, climate change response and uh, also developing a, uh, an action plan um, uh, that will set into motion adaptation and mitigation response measures for the um, uh, leading to us being able to do that partly maybe uh, towards the Paris Agreement uh, uh, commitments. Um, we continue to carry out uh, vulnerability sites as well as health assessments and make analysis of impacts that are directly attributable to climate change. These studies subsequently become or inform our national communications to the NFT uh, Remember, every four years, we have to submit um, our, our national communications, um, uh, communicate on the, uh, on the state of the, the environment, and uh, on a two-year uh, basis, we submit the PR, the binary reports, uh, these are assisted in terms of uh, putting up news. Uh, we have um, also piloted sustainable land management uh, uh, practices uh, carried out with, in partnership, of course, with uh, some of our development partners. And um, um, that will also provide data on the effectiveness of some of the strategic approaches for both adaptation and uh, uh, mitigation uh, response measures. Uh, conservation agriculture is one typical example that is currently developing the result, uh, results in Botswana. We uh, started using uh, systems such as the repairs and others, uh, which are very good in terms of conserving moisture in the soil. And we are seeing very good results coming out of these uh, uh, projects thus far. As we may all know, colleagues, Botswana is not an industrialized country. And therefore, pollution is currently not a very big problem for us. Um, however, we still make sure that uh, we measure all types of pollution in the country through so the Department of um, uh, Waste Management and Pollution Control, uh, measuring um, elements such as carbon dioxide, ozone, and other pollutants. Um, uh, this will assist us in terms of development of integrated risk management uh, policies uh, going into the future. Into the future. Um, carbon dioxide sequestration through the use of different tillage systems, in particular those such as the, the, the repass, uh, minimum tillage, zero tillage, and use of uh, living crops are part of our conservation agriculture strategy. And we should see that um, being implemented as we uh, uh, go forward. Um, drought comes very frequently from the world. It's not like the normal. And um, it has increased in the past uh, few years, uh, the frequency. We, 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 we have debates as whether well uh, we should consider drought as an abnormal situation or the normal and put in this as the abnormal uh, because of the frequency of the, of the droughts. Uh, we just came out of uh, a serious, serious drought uh, the year before us and we had uh, all the dams in the country failing. It's only after uh, this past rainfall season that we had good drains and uh, we had uh, some of the dams recovering. Um, um, in, in our national development plan, we have a section uh, that is taking uh, or addressing environmental thematic areas. And uh, um, we have also formed committees to look at these issues, and we are in the middle of um, um, developing a drought uh, monitoring a drought uh, monitoring strategy for, for the country. Um, 
we try for our professor to participate in the within the uh, development process. Of course, we have uh, uh, development uh, uh, partners such as uh, Australia and the University of Cape Town assisting us uh, uh, in the process. Um, what has happened because of the importance of the climate change issue, we have uh, some of the structures are based in the office of the president so that they get the required uh, 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 um, uh, impetus in terms of uh, developing processes in the country. Um, the research. Research is central to our efforts. And then we have tried to come up with um, uh, policies. We have also created some entities such as Bitri, we have institutions, and basically, and basically we are working on our, uh, the climate change policy. Uh, of course, uh, that will be uh, closely followed by the Climate Change Act, uh, which we are uh, hoping to start uh, somewhere early next year. Um, because of the importance of data, the government has uh, tried by almost to automate uh, data collection. Most of the time, research is uh, impeded by lack of data, because the data in the area, the whole of the, let me say, African region, there is a problem with data, there are a lot of gaps, and we have tried to uh, automate our system so that we have um, data that could uh, close the gaps that we have been able and allow uh, easier uh, research into um, uh, climate change. Um, therefore, we are happy to say now, at this stage, the IPCC can come and get uh, the data that they need uh, uh, for their research, and uh, we'll be very, very happy uh, to assist. And finally, as it has already been announced, uh, we are hosting the next annual IPCC meeting, the 1.5 degree report. And um, I hope to see all of you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And now this is uh, Miles Allen, who did the first presentation. I should introduce myself, by the way, for those who, those who don't know me, Adrian Macy from Victoria University of Wellington and New Zealand. Oh, well, thank you very much, um, and uh, thank you very much, Mr. Thoma, that uh, that uh, framing statement has actually set the context of this uh, uh, of this uh, uh, side event very well. Um, the, the, what we're doing here, uh, I was I was thinking a, a good analogy for it as I was on the uh, hotel exercise machine this morning. There's a very useful. Um, um, dial on the sort of screen on the hotel exercise machine which tells you continuously how hard you're working and I find without this information I think I'm working hard but then I usually discover that I'm not um, and so many people think in the context of this global stock take oh yeah we can let the IPCC do it the IPCC reports every seven years. As I'll be explaining in my talk, seven years is worth around a tenth of a degree. That's 20% of where we are now to 1.5 degrees. If you just wait for the next IPCC report, it's like switching off the dial, the switching off the screen on the uh, hotel exercise machine. And, well, if you're like me, um, then you'll, you'll definitely slow down your efforts. So, so, um, so we need this ability to continuously keep ourselves up to date on how we're making progress towards the long-term temperature goal because, believe me, getting to net zero is going to be a heck of a workout for the world over the next 40 years. By the way, I did find on this exercise machine there was a sort of magic button which, if you pressed it, made it much easier without actually, without actually reducing the rate of uh, a workout, which as a physicist I found troubling. And I thought this was a little bit like uh, solar geoengineering. And, and believe also me, once you discover this button, it's very tempting not to, not, not to press it. Anyway, moving on. So, so this is uh, monthly temperatures uh, since 1950, a very familiar uh, figure to you. But I just highlighted on this figure when the major climate conferences occur. And it immediately draws attention to the fact that temperatures fluctuate around. We have an annual report of what last year's temperature was with much fuss. Um, but the immediate temperature of last year isn't really the number we need to know in monitoring progress towards a long-term temperature goal. 
What we, you'll notice, of course, that the peak temperatures that we're seeing are going up very predictably in a remarkably straight line. But these El Nino events don't happen very often. The big ones only happen every once a decade or so. So we can't just rely on looking to see what the last peak warming was in order to spot where the temperatures are going. And in between these El Nino events, we see these long-term temperature fluctuations, which complicate the interpretation of the temperature record in terms of where we're going for uh, meeting a long-term temperature goal. Um, in the last, in the structured expert dialogue in the build-up to Paris, there was a very clear statement that we were now at, or we, we were now, we were then, that's in the sort of 2013 to 2015 period. One of the difficulties, of course, with climate is because it's changing so fast. The notion of now is quite a, 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 an important point to, to pin down. So um, in the structured expert dialogue, it was reported that the world was experiencing temperatures of 0.85 degrees above pre-industrial. But if we drill down, so that's what that structured expert dialogue where they put it, but if we drill down into the report, we find that you know this was based on a number of different indicators, none of which was exactly targeted at answering that specific question. What is the temperature we're at now? There was the sort of the straight line fit in the fifth assessment report that what was the gradient from 1880 to 2012, that was 0.85 degrees. But as you can see from this graph, a straight line fit is not a very good way of measuring what's happening to global temperatures. Likewise, the fact that the average temperature over the decade was also at about 0.85, um, or more sophisticatedly, if you took the average temperature of the IPCC's uh, uh, 1986 to 2005 period and then added on the trend which the IPCC had said was happening after to that, you also got to about 0.85 degrees. So it was all pointing in the same direction. That was a good number to give, but there wasn't an explicit process within the system which gives us this number every year. And this is what we're advocating is needed in order to provide, you know, on the screen in front of the negotiators, we should see this number ticking along so they know how hard they have to keep working. So. How do we do this? Um, so what's proposed in this paper that is actually published today in Scientific Reports, um, Hostein et al., um, is a method of providing a continuously updated index of human-induced warming. We start with observations of global temperature. It's an observational index. It's founded on what's actually happening in the real world. We combine that with the external climate drivers that we know about, human influences in orange and natural fluctuations in blue there. We allow for the fact that the climate system responds sluggishly to these drivers. That's why when I look at these responses with ocean inertia, the, the volcano sm spikes are a bit less spiky. But otherwise, there's no modeling involved in this. It's an observational product. And then we work out which of this broad range of responses is consistent with the observations. And we use nothing more complicated here than the least squares fit you can do on an Excel spreadsheet. So the key point is anybody can calculate this with publicly available numbers, and they could do it on an Excel spreadsheet live during a negotiation. So it's, it's not something you have to wait for the next IPCC assessment for. It provides you with a continuously up-to-date number, a bit like that clock on the back of the room, which is frightening me a little bit. Okay, so this is where we're at. Um, this estimate of human-induced warming reached one degree in 2017 and is currently increasing actually faster than ever. It's increasing uh, at the moment at uh, over 0.2 degrees per decade. Uh, it's, very it's very important to stress, of course, I'm talking about global average temperature here. Many regions, as uh, Mr. Botsama already mentioned, many regions have actually already experienced more than uh, one, much more than one degree of warming. In fact, uh, this region here, uh, which is very near Botswana, uh, has in fact already experienced something close to three degrees of warming since pre-industrial times. So part of what we're doing in the uh, 1.5 degree special report is emphasizing the spatial diversity of the signal and the fact, of course, that 1.5 global does not mean 1.5 in your hometown. And in many regions of the world, the impacts, even 1.5 degrees, could be really severe. And so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr. Botsama for drawing attention to that, and it, it fits very nicely in to this presentation.
So we can use this by using this index of global uh, average temperature of, of, of human-induced warming. This minimizes our sensitivity to natural fluctuations. And the sort of heavy line you can see there, the one which wiggles slightly, that's what would have happened if we had estimated this index every year for the past 30 years or so. And you'll notice it doesn't go, it, does, it didn't stop in 1998. It did, we, didn't, we don't see a, what, this notorious hiatus in this index. Of course we don't, because that was natural variability. Human induced warming continued predictably, getting warmer every year, exactly as you would expect it to do on physical grounds. So this is why an index like this would be useful. It would, you'd avoid all these arguments about, oh, has global warming stopped? And believe me, we're going to have them again. People are going to say, oh, global warming stopped in 2016 because of such a warm year, people will look back as far as 2016 and say, oh, look, look, it was warmer than that. So before that starts happening, we need to get people's minds onto a, an index of human-induced warming. Um, and it's consistent entirely with the structured expert dialogue. Uh, Adrian's getting edgy, so I will point out that it is sensitive to the data set you use. Um, and it, finally, one of the reasons we need to, to know both how, what level of warming we're at and also um, how fast it's warming now is that determines the time we have to stabilize temperatures. If you're warming rapidly, then you've got less time to act. If we're warming slowly, you've got more time to act. And the, the, the level of warming that we're also, so, so knowing exactly where we are now is crucial to knowing how we're progressing towards the long-term temperature goal. So this is why it's an essential, what, we, what we're saying is we think this should be considered an essential climate variable, and I put capitals on that because yes, there is a message here for the WMO. It's not enough just to release the global mean temperature of last year. We need to know every year before the COP how far has human induced warming got to. And this should be part of the information that should be available to everyone involved in this process. And it gives us, a, it gives us uh, one of the elements of the, one of the pieces of information we need to know as to whether we're on track for net zero, whether we're reducing emissions fast enough to achieve our long term temperature goal. Uh, and of course, you know, and, and this is what is now going to be covered in the next two presentations what we mean, you know, what we have to think about as we reduce emissions, and also ultimately uh, how we measure whether we've uh, achieved net zero uh, in, in, in the end. So I'll now hand over to Keith Shine, who will talk about the next step, which is how we measure the reduction in emissions, in total emissions, as we um, embark on this workout towards net zero. I'm glad you have the whole discussion to the, to the end, because I think the three presentations fit really uh, nice and tightly together. Yep, so, so uh, thank you, Miles. Thank you to the Deputy Permanent Secretary and to all of you for coming this afternoon. Um, so I want to thank the, my, my collaborators on this, and I've underlined Miles on that because he's very much driven the work that um, I'm going to be talking about today. So um, thank you, Miles. So what I'm going to talk about today is the, the different metrics that we use to compare emissions of different greenhouse gases. So I'll give a bit of background and um, explain how we got to where we are, but I'll also introduce uh, a new metric um, which we call the GWP star, and this uses the standard global warming potential but in a new context that we believe is much more suitable for the short-lived climate pollutants, the SLCPs. And in this talk, um, as Adrian's already said, I'll, I'll use CO2 as of course the most important long-lived gas and I'll use methane as the most um, important short-lived gas, but what I'm going to say is of more general um, applicability to those classes of long and short-lived gases. So also because people come and go at presentations like this, I'm going to show this slide twice. It's the punchlines, it's my final slide, but it's the, the summary, is that when CO, the methane emissions are falling, which we hope they will be soon, um, it turns out that if you calculate their CO2 equivalents using the standard 100-year global warming potential, um, it would indicate that those falling emissions would be causing further warming when in fact they're causing the cooling, and I'll explain this in detail later. Um, this, this problem with the GWP um, can be solved using the GWP star. Um, what this does is, those of you who are familiar with the GWP, is it compares a pulse emission of methane with a pulse emission of CO2, but what this um, GWP star does is to equate a sustained step change in methane emissions with a one-off 
um, change in, in CO2. And um, the, the, the GWP star um, is very good at, at uh, telling, predicting the future temperature change and also the peak warming coincides with net zero total emissions using GWP star. So our contention is that the GWP star is much better than GWP for monitoring progress towards um, a long-term temperature goal. So I'll step back a bit and talk a bit more generally about metric design. Um, and what a metric is there to do, or a climate emission metric, uh, more specifically, is to provide an exchange rate. Um, they allow the climate effect of any gas emission to be compared with an emission of carbon dioxide. And if you've got this climate emission metric, you can put all the, all the gases we're emitting on a common carbon uh, or CO2 equivalent scale. Now, if the metric was perfect, uh, a CO2 equivalent emission, no matter whether it's how it's made up from the different gases, would give the same climate effect. Um, but in, in practice, as we're going to show, the conventional metrics fail to do this, um, particularly when we get into constant or falling emissions. And there are many, many different choices we have in choosing a metric, but, but ultimately the other point we, we wish to stress is that the choice of metric should be guided by the policy that it is intended to serve. And if we look back to how we got to use um, the GWP 100, well, the Kyoto Protocol uses a 100-year GWP, and mostly the values that were in the 95 IPCC assessment. And the NDCs um, also use that GWP 100 values, which come from a variety of different IPCC assessments. And they're generally accepted as, a, as an appropriate measure by the user community. But um, we have to realise that at the time of the Kyoto Protocol, the IPCC had only assessed one metric, which was the GWP. And also, another choice that Kyoto had to make was which time horizon to choose, and it chose 100. The most recent IPCC report also introduced uh, another metric, the Global Temperature Change Potential, GTP, but it didn't actively recommend either the GWP or the GTP. And the problem with CO2 equivalents that I'm going to t talk about today is shared by all these conventional metrics. So GTP, GWP, all with different time horizons still share the main difficulty that I'm going to come to. So the other thing that I think is important to stress is that um, the methane GWP is quite a um, volatile beast. If we look at the table on there, it shows the evolution of the GWP 100 over the different IPCC reports. And we can see in the first assessment report it was 21, in the most recent it was 28. And it changes because um, of our changing understanding of things like the lifetime of methane and the indirect effect of methane, for example, its impact on, um, on ozone. And the other reason that it changes is not because of methane itself, but because the metric is relative to CO2 emissions. If our understanding of the effect of a pulse of CO2 changes, then that changes the GWP of all gases. And again, it's not widely really understood, I think, that the IP, last IPCC report stated that the uncertainty in these GWPs was plus or minus 40%, so quite a substantial uncertainty. And if we look at the science that's been published since the um, most recent IPCC report, um, and if that was judged to be robust by the next IPCC report, um, that 28 could turn into something near a 35. So qu quite, um, quite large changes in indicating um, volatility as our understanding goes on. So that's my, my general introduction to metrics, and what I want to come to now is more specifically our, our, um, our ideas on how to reconcile short-lived and long-lived emissions in the context of the uh, Paris temperature target. So, so uh, a fair bit of the work I'm going to talk about has already been published in this paper in 2016, and we have another paper that has been recently submitted, um, which... Um, which covers much of the other material. And for those of you who have come in late, we've got a, got a handout here, which I hope there's more copies of, which includes many of the figures. Yes, at, at the back there's more copies of this. But, um, that many of the figures in today's in presentation are in, in that report, as well as an added explanation. So um, if we look at this diagram here, the, the top diagram shows what happens if you emit a pulse of 
um, methane or a pulse of CO2. So the, um, the x-axis is the time in years and the y-axis is the radiative forcing. So if we look at the methane pulse, methane decays with a lifetime of 10 years and we can see it dropping very rapidly as it's destroyed by chemical reactions in the atmosphere. Um, the CO2 is destroyed or removed, I should say, much less rapidly and so that black line you can see that the CO2 is still persisting um, throughout this 100 years. Um, and what the global warming potential does is really to compare the areas under those curves up to a given time horizon. So in the case of Kyoto, it's 100 years. Now, that pulse of radiative forcing doesn't translate into a pulse of in, into the effect on temperature in a straightforward way. So the bottom plot shows the change in temperature as a result of that pulse in radiative forcing. And because of the thermal inertia of the climate system that it takes a while to respond, we can see that the effect of the methane emission um, is a, a rapid response and then it dies off as the pulse of uh, methane is removed from the atmosphere. But for CO2, it's quite different. And um, the CO2 temperature change is still, um, still persisting after 100 years. So although there's equivalence in terms of the area under the curve in the top plot, there is not equivalence in terms of the temperature effect, except at one point in time. And the only way we could mimic that long-term effect of CO2 would be to continue to emit methane during that 100 years to keep the temperature effect of the methane up at the CO2 curve. And this is um, shown again in a, in a rather similar plot here on the left-hand side um, from the Alan et al. 2016 paper. If we just concentrate on the, the blue methane pulse and then the lower red line, which is a CO2 pulse, this is using the actual emissions of CO2 in 2011 converted to um, methane equivalents. And, and we can see exactly the same thing as we had in the, the last plot with the me methane pulse giving a higher temperature change at short times but a much lower temperature change on long time. But on the right hand side we've um, done something else. Instead of emitting a pulse of, of methane, we emit the same amount of methane but we've spread out that emission over the whole hundred years. And um, the dashed red line, which shows the CO2, is exactly the same red line as on the left-hand plot, but we've expanded the scale. And we can see, compared to the left-hand plot, the, the similarity between the methane sustained emission and the CO2 pulse emission is much better than if we compare two pulses. So what we're saying here is that there's a closer equivalence between a sustained change in methane emission rate and a pulse emission of CO2. And so um, this leads then to this improved metric. So at the top, um, what, what it states is what we do now, that in the conventional usage of a GWP 100, it says the CO2 equivalent of a methane emission is a 100-year GWP multiplied by the methane emission. But the only equivalence this gives is in the integrated radiative forcing. Um, under GWP star, if we move down to the next black bit, the, the equivalence comes from the change in methane emission rate. So H times the GWP times the change in methane emission rate gives you the CO2 equivalent. So now the equivalence, instead of being an integrated radiative forcing, is actually in temperature change, which is more appropriate to the Paris goals. So the next slide is only for um, any metric geeks in the audience. I can see one. Um, but uh, the, um, and, uh, I'm happy to talk to people about this afterwards if they want to. But I want to focus on the second blue one, which one, one of the difficulties with the GWP is choosing an appropriate time horizon because the GWP of a gas like methane varies um, considerably going from 20 to 100 years. But there's something which is quite nice about the GWP star is it's much less sensitive to that choice. Um, and, and so um, your, your perceived um, equivalent CO2 emissions don't change so much when you change the, um, ch uh, change the time horizon. So again, just, just an example then, if, uh, a, a few examples of this application under, under GWP. A one ton methane emission is equivalent to 28 tons of CO2. 
Under GWP star, it means a one ton per year increase in methane emission rate is equivalent to 2,800 tons of a one-off um, emission of CO2. And it doesn't only work for an increase in emission rates, it also works for a decrease. So a one ton per year decrease in methane emission rates is equivalent to a one-off removal of 2,800 tonnes of, of CO2. Um, but one important thing to state here is that this equivalence is only true if, if your methane decrease is sustained. So if you decrease your methane emissions in one year and they go up in the next, this equivalence is lost. So that's a very important thing to stress. Okay, so um, the several points that come out from this, um, uh, the, the left-hand plots there show the case where both methane and CO2 emissions are increasing, and in both those cases it's the warming in the bottom plot due to CO2 and methane are both increasing. So increasing um, of both leads to an increasing temperature of both. But if we come to constant emissions, um, so if CO2 is constant, because CO2 accumulates in the atmosphere, the bottom plot shows that CO2, the temperature continues to increase. But it's quite different from methane. If methane, well, me, if methane emissions are held constant, then the CO2... Sorry, I'm mixing my things. Let's start that sentence again. If methane emissions are constant, then the temperature response to those methane emissions remains constant. Whereas if you turn those methane emissions into their CO2 equivalents, they would wrongly tell you, and that's a dashed line in the bottom right-hand corner, that temperatures would um, continue to increase. So again, we stress here that we're not saying that methane um, emissions do not cause a temperature change. They clearly do, and if we cut methane emissions, um, we would get a gain in temperature. But what we're saying is if we hold methane emissions constant, there is no further warming from those. So if you have a herd of cattle and you don't increase the size of your herd of cattle, they, will be, they may have contributed to a temperature increase in the past, but if that herd of cattle is kept constant, then they won't contribute to further warming. So, and, and even more starkly, is if we go into a regime of falling emissions, um, then falling methane emissions are actually equivalent to CO2 removal because they're leading to a cooling, which is what the bottom plot shows. Um, whereas if we use the conventional GWP and the conventional CO2 equivalents, um, until those methane emissions reach zero, they would be perceived as causing a continued um, um, increase in, in, in temperature. So again, um, the, the GWP doesn't do a, a very strong job. So just the story so far then, to summarise, is that the, the, although the conventional GWP might be reasonable when emissions of methane are, are increasing, it fails when they are constant or falling. And I, I was involved in the very first IPCC assessment report, that's a 19, although I don't look old enough, the IPCC um, 1990 report is there. And I would say that this issue of when you get to falling or constant emissions in methane is the, the greatest challenge to the integrity of GWP since they were first um, developed in that um, assessment report. Okay, so I'm going to show um, examples now um, of, of an application where methane emissions are falling. And the left-hand plot, so th these are all using the, um, the representative concentration pathway 2.6, so that, that's one which aims to get a 2 degree warming. And the first plots are going to be using the conventional GWP100. The left-hand plots show the change in emissions going back from 1900 up to 2100, and the right-hand plot shows the cumulative emissions, so the integral of the time integral of those emissions. And what we can see is that um, CO2, is, which is the red line, it also includes nitrous oxide, but that's a small component. But CO2 emissions go up and then start to come down as we go deeper into this century. And similarly, methane emissions do the same. But under the GWP100 metric, if you convert those methane emissions to a CO2 equivalent, it looks as though CO2, it looks as though methane is accumulating in the atmosphere. 
And on the next plot, the, right, the, the left-hand plot is exactly the same, but the right-hand plot, set the dashed lines show the temperature response to those emissions. And the most, uh, you can see that the red solid line in the right-hand plot and the red dashed line show that um, CO2 equivalence works well for CO2, which is as we would expect. But for methane, we can see it does not. The dashed line shows the actual temperature response to those rising and falling methane emissions. But if we assume that they um, have a CO2 equivalence using GWP100, then the temperatures would continue to increase during the century. <coughs> so the next plot shows similar ones, but using the GWP star. So the left-hand plot now shows the, the CO2 equivalent star emissions. And the most important thing is that the CO2 equivalence is now given by the rate of change of the methane curve. So we saw that the methane emissions came up to a maximum and then fell down. So at the point of maximum, the change in methane emissions is zero. And as they fall, the emissions are equivalent to a negative or CO2 removal. And so we can see that that, um, that, that red arrow points to, to when the CO2 equivalent emissions of methane come to zero and then um, go negative. And then the next plot um, is, is the same as before. We've now added the dashed lines on the right-hand side, which show the temperature response to those emissions. And what we can see is that unlike the GWP, the conventional GWP one, we can see that the new metric, um, the temperature response, very much follows the um, cumulative CO2 equivalent emissions in a way that it absolutely didn't for the GWP 100. So, um, and, and another feature which is, uh, of course, desirable is that um, peak warming should occur at the time that net CO2 equivalent emissions reach zero. And this is true under the GWP star, but it's not true. I didn't show it pointed out earlier. It's not the case when we use the GWP 100. So that brings me back to the slide I, I started with, which is the punchlines, is that if we've got a scenario of falling methane emissions, then the CO2 equivalents calculated using the, um, the 100-year GWP indicates a further warming instead of a cooling. The GWP star, which compares a sustained step change in emissions with a pulse of CO2, um, resolves this problem. And um, it also predicts peak warming at the time that net total emissions come to zero. And, and so our contention is that the GWP star is better suited to a long-term temperature goal treaty like the Paris Agreement than the GWP. So thank you very much for your attention. Professor Fung, you want to invite Jan Fugusha? In this presentation, then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to talk about uh, the issue of balance in the Paris Agreement. So, uh, if you look at Article 4, you can see that this article is quite uh, rich. It has many elements and issues. And if we focus on parts of the text here, we may ask, how is balance defined? How are sources and sinks balanced across greenhouse gases? And what is meant by greenhouse gases? Which gases are included in this group? So we can look at this. It doesn't work. <laughs> Shall I start from <laughs> Okay, so we can, uh, regarding which gases to include in this balance consideration, we can look at this well-known graph from the IPCC showing the radiative forcing from the different components. We can see that CO2 gives the largest contribution, but also contributions from methane, nitrous oxide, and heavy carbons. And then below that, on the left side, we see all the short-lived components, CO, NOx, black carbon, and then various aerosols giving cooling and warming effects. So there are many components affecting climate. But um, Kyoto, they adopted a multi-gas approach, uh, or a basket approach, and included CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, HFCs, PFCs, SF6, and NF3 in the Kyoto basket. So this could be a starting point when we look at the balance 
And aerosols, if you look at the text of the Paris Agreement, aerosols are not included in the, in the balance concept. And um, what are the implications of metric choices on the timing of nominal net zero emissions? The Paris text says that we should achieve balance in the second half of this century. Let's have a look at some scenarios. On the left-hand side, you see the individual emission pathways for the main gases, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide, and the F gases. And by using metrics, we can aggregate these very different gases to CO2 equivalents. So the main graph there shows the development in CO2 equivalents based on GWP values from the second assessment report. Quite old values, actually. And you can also see that the different scenarios, they cross the zero line at different points in time, in the second half of the century, mainly. And if we change this uh, graph a little, the, the upper one is still the different uh, emission pathways. And then we have plotted the net zero timing. And you can see that for, if you look at the 1.5 case in the middle, we can see that the net zero time is reached in the second half of the century. And that the choice of GWP value, whether it's from the second or third or fourth or fifth assessment report, doesn't have a dramatic impact on the timing of net zero. But if you choose GDP, it will have a quite large effect much earlier in the century. And if you choose one of the really short-lived or the short time horizons, I mean, GWP 20 or GDP 20, then it will not occur in these scenarios in this century. So choice of metric has a huge impact on the perceived timing of a net zero based or expressed in CO2 equivalents. I will come back to these uh, red cases later. Um, then we may ask, what does net zero really mean? We have to balance positive emissions with negative emissions. And the positive emissions may be remaining methane and nitrous oxide emissions, emissions that we are not able to reduce beyond a certain level. And then we need to balance this by negative emissions of CO2 based on some type of CO2 equivalent. And for that, as we learned, we need a metric. And the metric choice and the time horizon choice will affect the magnitude of the negative CO2 emissions needed. So you can see that the size of the negative CO2 emissions really varies with the choice of metric. The largest negative CO2 emissions are needed for the metrics with short time horizons, the red ones. And what is the temperature effect of this, well, not artificial, but this balance? they will obviously have a different uh, temperature effect given the large differences in negative CO2 emissions. So here we have plotted over a 100 year time uh, scale the temperature development based on these different interpretations of balance. And you can see the blue one, GWP100, causes a cooling, sustained cooling. And the shorter time horizons gives a much stronger cooling. And you can also see GWP star, which is closest to the zero line on the upper part of the graph. So how you interpret the balance will have a physical response that is, that is really dependent on how you interpret the balance and which metric you use. Typometric and time horizon. We can also link what I said to what Keith just said, that the year of peak warming point size with the year when the CO2 equivalent star emissions reach zero. So if we use this new metric, GWP star, and achieve net zero, we will have peak warming approximately that year, and we will start the reduction in temperature. So, conclusions. There are several ways to define balance, and I just discussed uh, two of them, the choice of gases and the type of metric. There are many other issues as well that need to be addressed before we can implement 
uh, or have a well-defined definition of, of the balance. And the metric issue is open, as far as we can see in the Paris text. Aerosols are not included in the balance. That means black carbon cannot be included in these balance considerations. And a default option seemed to be to use the Kyoto basket of greenhouse gases, but that is not yet specified. So we think that is an issue that needs to be discussed. And achieving and maintaining net zero CO2 equivalent emissions based on GWP 100, the traditional GWP that was used in Kyoto and also for reporting, could lead us to a cooling trend and could risk uh, making the goal seem unachievable because we would need large CO2 negative emissions to balance the methane emissions. The GWP star would result in global mean temperatures remaining approximately constant once we have net zero CO2 equivalent star emissions, once we have achieved that and maintained that level. <laughs> and science policy dialogue can help to advance these issues in the context of the Paris Agreement and the global stock Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to all our presenters for being able to finish um, exactly what we did want to finish to allow a good half hour for some discussion. And I did just what I, the three very simple points that I took from the three presentations that we've just heard. One, it will be very useful for us um, during the course of the Paris Agreement's implementation to be better informed about the state of human induced warming through an index, for example, and second, it would appear that we would have a choice of a metric that is better aligned with the long-term goals of the Paris Agreement. But three, um, we need to be very careful about how we interpret the uh, balance concept in the Paris Agreement and how that is put in, into effect. Um, I have noticed also that the, the discussions here on metrics appear to have been pushed forward to 20, I think June 2019. I don't think anyone in the room was involved in it, it might possibly during the discussion to explain uh, what is going on there. But I think we do have a we do have grounds here for some really uh, useful dialogue between science and policy. And if I could just indulge myself um, and ask Keith a question. Um, sitting I'm now assuming I'm a New Zealand farmer with 500 or 1,000 dairy cows. Um, is what you were saying, if I keep my emissions, if I stick with my, fun, my herd, my 500 or 1,000 cows, and, I, and those methane emissions stay constant, that I'm not contributing any more to global warming, and I'm no longer a climate criminal. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you will have contributed to global warming by having those cattle, but once you've got a, a steady state herd, then there will be no further warming on them at all. Maybe your, maybe your grandfather bought the herd, so it was your grandfather who bought the, 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 the contributed, and as a Brit, of course, to them, you know, we were the ones who were the first climate criminals, of course, you know, we've been doing this for a while. <laughs> Okay, well, I think with that, um, thank you for that response. So I will now open up the floor for questions. And, and please indicate um, um, the UI think should be a broken mic somewhere. Uh, and maybe indicate which of the presenters you'd like to address your question to. Uh, hi, I'm August Matsulevich. I'm coming from European Economic and Social Committee. I just would like to clarify a little bit your question about the cows, 500 cows, but there are technologies available, for example, biodigesting or closing in the closed uh, facility and uh, taking all the methane and, for example, getting electricity and heat out of that. In this case, investing in that and reducing the emission, how it will contribute to your climate, is it clever to do or as you say just stick to the house and do nothing or what what is the message over here thank you take it away that, well that, if i understand the question that that would be equivalent to a co2 removal um because you're 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 preventing that methane being emitted into the atmosphere so it would be a good thing and and, and the impact of a of methane reduction is enormous provided it's sustained. 
So if you reduce methane emissions for one year and then they go back up again, the long-term climate benefit is nil. But if you reduce them and then keep them down, the long-term climate benefit is enormous. And the metric we're proposing would reflect that. Um, yeah, was about two or three questions. Roger, this is all the same place. Thank you. My name is Atik Raman, I'm Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies. Um, I've been very closely involved with the IPCC from this inception right up to almost now. And um, what is extremely interesting is that the global warming potential, as you report it, uh, isn't constant and it's variable. Not only that, it can keep on varying uh, given, the, given the conditions, etc. My question is, as a you know, policymaker here, the minister wants to ask, what shall I do? Should I try to reduce carbon? Should I have to reduce methane? Should I try to reduce black carbon? Whatever. You know, the policy option becomes very, very complex now for a scientist trying to communicate to <laughs> policymakers. And is there a sort of optimal line, or is it a number of variables that we have to keep on handle, handling, and then if you give them more than three variables, you have lost your leader. You see, so uh, here is the challenge, I think, what scientists can do and can't do, and how to place it if we all really wanted just not carbon, greenhouse gas to come down in the, you know, 1.5 for me is uh, politically very useful. Technically, I think is out of our reach. Uh, two degrees is more likely. But if you can show that uh, 1.5 degrees is serious, uh, worth chasing, then that would remain very interesting. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for your comments. Um, it's more than a comment than a question, I think, in, in a way. But, but, uh, I think one of the, the reasons why the Kyoto Protocol, I don't know if Jan will agree with me, stuck to using the second assessment GWPs rather than continuously updating them was to stop a volatility. So on the one hand, you should be using the best available science, but on the other hand, if you're suddenly told that your methane emissions are 20% worth 20% more than they were before that most recent IPCC report. I think that would be probably unacceptable to many parties. So I think there's a balance between continuity of, of policy and, and using the best available science. But I agree it's a problem that you're not using the best available science when you implement uh, measures. And um, so I hope there is possibility, there will be possibilities for a more dynamic interaction between science and uh, mitigation. But I don't have the answer. But I agree that this is a really important question. There has to be a lag because you have to see whether those uh, numbers are robust and scientifically stable. Also, so some lag we have to accept. That. But, but on a sort of positive side, I mean, we accept that the, the, the revision we're proposing, so treating a flow of methane, a change in the rate of flow of methane as equivalent to a pulse emission of CO2, that would be quite traumatic from a policy perspective because it would mean that it's a big change. But we have an opportunity to do it because we've got this couple of years of thinking about metrics outside the process because Apparently, they're, they're not going to, according to Adrian, they're not really going to be revisiting this until 2019. And the point we're warning people is if we carry on muddling along with GWP because it's the one that people are using and are used to, the problems are just going to get worse and worse and worse as we go into mitigation. When, when emissions were rising, it didn't really matter so much what metric you used to measure them. But once emissions are falling, it's going to become completely obvious that global warming potential is not fit for purpose to monitor progress to the long-term temperature goal. And so the sooner we start talking about this, the better, because we all hope that emissions are going to be falling pretty soon. Um, there was a question in the oh, Maybe if you're close, we'll take those two questions then we'll see in the one of the <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to return to the ambassador's question about his livestock and his contribution to global warming. I thought that response was, was very interesting and important and consistent with what I heard, but possibly easy to misinterpret. And I think that the interpretation depends on whether you take global warming to be a noun, 
the 0.85 degrees or the one degree of warming that's in the atmosphere now, or a verb form, a gerund, global warming that is in process, continued global warming. And I think that's correct, consistent with the presentation. He isn't currently contributed to increasing global warming, but his livestock most certainly does contribute to the one degree that's in the atmosphere now. And decreasing livestock will remove that contribution to warming. And the responsibility didn't end with his grandparents who put the livestock on the land. Could you confirm that that's a correct interpretation? Yes, that would be the correct interpretation. So, so uh, it would be analogous to the owner of a closed coal-fired power station. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, the owner of a constant herd of cattle, of a, of a static herd of cattle, is the same as somebody who owns a coal-fired power station, put a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, caused a lot of warming in the past, but they've now closed it. That's the analogous situation. The, diff the difference, though, is the owner of the cattle, unlike the owner of the closed power station, has an enormous mitigation opportunity on his hands. Because he can reduce his methane using either technical measures, as was pointed out by the first question, or, or perhaps by reducing the number of cattle. And I gather there may, on some counts, be too many cattle in New Zealand, according to some environmentalists, at least. I wouldn't venture into, into, into that. But, um, but that, so, so unlike the defunct power station owner, the owner of the cattle has a mitigation opportunity. And it's important to recognize that that herd of cattle is both a host responsibility and a mitigation opportunity. Okay, so we'll take the third question from there, then we'll move to the front row. Thank you uh, for having me. Uh, I'm, my name is Kiana, I'm a representative of Northeastern University and also an NGO. Um, I wanted to, if I may, touch back on the analogy that started the presentation, you know, the heart rate monitor uh, that fueled the exercise machine. And as simple as that was, I actually think it reads another important question about when we know what we're doing is enough and when we know it's too much or too little. Because oftentimes on a heart rate machine as a human, you max out at 220 beats per minute. You know when you're peaking. You need to reduce your heart rate back to a stable zone. And you know, 160 beats per minute is what we're aiming for. But as we know with climate change and, and our efforts to reduce our impact, there is no limit. We want to maximize as much uh, transformation into clean and, and renewable energy as we can. But how do we prevent states from looking at this constant updated metric and saying, okay, we've, we've been on target for the past five to 10 years, we can sit back now. Nations who are major polluters can say, well, look, at we're hitting the goals that we thought we might hit. We don't need to push ourselves any further. How do we keep nations to push themselves and, and press them to continue when they might look at a metric, a constant updated uh, data set and say, it's good enough? So um, if you want to reach net zero by the time global temperatures reach 1.5 degrees, you have to reduce emissions by 20% per tenth of a degree of warming from now on. That's not a policy, that's a fact. That's just mathematics. So a tenth of a degree of warming at the moment takes about six to seven years. If the nations of the world were reducing emissions by 20%, measured accurately using an metric by GWP star, every tenth of a degree of warming, that is every six to seven years, I'd say good on you, well done. Okay, we're on target. We're a long way from that. So I don't think there's any danger of people looking at these numbers, objective numbers being provided them continuously, of, of, in, in the near term at least, of nations feeling, yeah, we can relax now. Uh, I think the bigger danger, just as I find on the exercise machines, if you don't have the numbers all the time, you sort of think, oh, I'm working hard, so, oh, this is tough. Um, and then, you know, so I must be doing myself a lot of good, and then you actually get the numbers at the end, and you're asking, you won't be actually doing that much. So, so, so this sort of, you know, providing these numbers continuously, it, it should, should really, we, we think, help people um, appreciate how, how they're doing towards the long-term temperature goal. Okay, we move to the front row now. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Eivind Christofferson. I come from the Norwegian Environment Agency. Um, I, have a, I would like to have a question on the other part of the side event, which was the, the temperature and the, um, what Miles called, uh, was it human-induced temperature or, or something like that? Um, so, um, because I think uh, it's important then to recognize what is said in the Paris Agreement, and in the Paris Agreement it's uh, it's not uh, talking about uh, the, the, the temperature in each year, it said um, 
um, holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Uh, and, uh, and then takes to on the 1.5, and then it ends with recognizing that this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts of climate change. So, so I think uh, this means that we are talking about the average temperature, and also it's a connection to, in a way, I think temperature is seen as an indicator how we can uh, reduce the effects and the risks of, of climate change. So my question to, to Marcel will then be to what extent he feel that this proposed index is in line with what is said in, in, uh, in Article 2 in the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Um, well, I can answer that very quickly. Yes, um, we, we can check that, that this index of human induced warming is a very good indicator of the long term average temperature you get in the absence of large volcanoes. So, the only thing that really disturbs temperature away from the human induced, the temperature change away from the human induced warming would be uh, a, a large volcano, for example, and that would only disturb it away for a few years. So, we think this index is actually very well aligned with what we imagine, and as Adrian pointed out, the framers of the Paris Agreement weren't exactly specific on exactly what every word means, but we think this index would be very well aligned with uh, with what they were talking about uh, when they were talking about the long-term temperature control. And crucially, of course, this component of the warming is the only component we have any control over. I mean, we can't control when volcanoes go off, um, and uh, but we, we can control the warming caused by greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the that's the, the, the important point to, 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 to bear in mind here. Um, <coughs> so of course, still a question. Yeah, one more question in the front row. Yeah. Okay. Hello, I'm Naomi from the UK Youth Climate Coalition. Um, what kind of resistance do you expect in uh, making this change in metrics happen? <laughs> okay, uh, I expect some uh, resistance because uh, the reporting system is based on the GWP, so it's really a well established uh, metric. And, um, I just respect that situation and I understand it's very difficult to change. But uh, there are many different levels of using metrics. So it doesn't mean that everything has to change. But we can use this for certain purposes. And perhaps it will change more over time. But I would like to return the question to the audience because there are many people here who know more how this will be received. And it would be so interesting to hear whether this is too academic or whether this is something that can be implemented. Does anyone, want, does anyone want to comment on that? Does anyone want to comment on that particular point before we go to other questions? Oh, well, oh, you all do. Okay. <laughs> okay. I suppose that we'll be sort of continuing to um, add to that point, which was raised by someone from the Youth Alliance. I, uh, my name is Olga. I had the pleasure of studying climate change with Miles uh, in my master's. I happen to work for WMO. I in no way represent the organization in my um, I, I, right now asking this question. But um, understanding the value of adding human-induced um, uh, contribution to the, to the temperature increase, uh, in addition to just talking about the temperature increase every year, um, which would make the issue probably more relevant for um, the target audience. Um, I was wondering whether you looked into a possibility of integrating this um, uh, index and your metrics um, into what WMO has right now as integrated global greenhouse gas information system, uh, which actually aims to measure not just uh, the temperature increase, and the emissions by sector, but also how much of these emissions remain in the atmosphere and lead to the temperature increase. Because you talked about the essential climate variables, which is uh, correct. I mean, this could be one of the ways, but maybe uh, discussing merging your approach with this um, IG3IS uh, could be another avenue to explore. Thank you.
Yeah, I mean, we're academics. We're the last people you want to be publishing an index regularly every year. I and mean, that's one of the things you can see in the IPCC process is scientists want to be imaginative, and so they keep changing things. Some, sometimes one feels almost the sake of being different from the last one. So we'd be delighted to hand this over to an institution like the WMO who can then decide what the method is going to use and just issue the index every year. That, that, I believe, is the way it should happen. You shouldn't leave this to the scientists. We're not responsible in that way. <laughs> if I could add a point on the, on the question regarding how difficult it might be to get something like this accepted, I'm, I'm speaking as an ex-policy person. I mean, it seems to me you don't have to have a premise that um, you need to get the whole world to agree with you to change. I mean, let's say a country is thinking about its transition plan to net zero uh, and it decides that um, for the sake of its gas pricing that PWP star makes more sense than PWP 100. Well, it's nothing to prevent the country basing its policies on that then reporting against them, demonstrating how aligned they are with the Paris Agreement. And also, if they want, uh, if required, you can still report using the old metrics. And it seems to me it's not a, it's not, it's not an, it's not a, a more or nothing issue. There. Anyway, that was my comment, and not in my role as chair, but as a policy person. Um, yeah, in the middle there. Thank you. Um, my name is Philippe Marbet. I'm from the university in Belgium. And I have a question for clarification that is related to the policy application of these metrics. Um, I wonder if I understood it well. But my understanding is, is that, uh, let's take an example. I want to reduce one ton of CO2 and promise to do it that next year. It will be something that can be verified next year if I did or did not reduce my one ton of CO2. By contrast, if I uh, commit to reduce by the equivalent of one ton, uh, but in methane and compute with that uh, new metric, what do I commit to? I have the impression that I do not commit for something to do next year. I commit to an action uh, now and forever. Uh, and that is, for uh, the point of view of verification, probably a problem. And I would like to, I see that you know, so I imagine that I am right, but I would like to know what you, how, how you think that this could be solved uh, in a policy framework. Thank you. That me, me, absolutely. It, one, one thing that was on my slide is that on the illustrations that I showed for the GWP star, the calculations that Miles and colleagues did, they were taking the difference over a 20-year period. If, if you took it over a very short period, mm -hmm. uh, as someone was telling us earlier today, you, if you're a farmer, you have no great control about how many number of calves are going to be born in one particular year. So your methane emissions could be going up and down with various years. So it's important that you take a, a long-term view on this. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right on, on, on that. Do you want to add? Yeah, but the, the key thing is that this is what the global temperature sees. So, uh, no, but you, you shrug and say, the point is, it's only a problem that you're describing if you change the rules as you go along. If you stick with it, if you make a reduction in methane, but then you let it go up again in the future, then you will be hit, you'll have to pay to increase your methane emissions again. So, it, it, it actually does work if you think it through, but it only works if the rules, the same rules, are applied <coughs> going forward in time. Yeah, I mean, obviously if you change the rules um, and go back to using conventional GWP, then yeah, it would be chaos. But the point, the, the point here is that you need a, a system which can last for a long time. And crucially, these systems do last for a long time. We're still using second assessment report GWPs, for heaven's sakes. I mean, there's a huge inertia in this. As we get into falling emissions, we need a system that's fit for purpose that can actually get us to net zero. And we don't have that at the moment. So even though you may find all this mind bending, we're going to have to get our minds around it. Hi, Kita Prasad. I'm a climate scientist at the Carnegie Institution at Stanford University. And I wanted to get us back to the black carbon issue, maybe against everyone's better judgment. Um, so black carbon, as many of you know, and apologies if this was discussed earlier, I came in a little bit late, but it's even harder, more hairy to calculate a CO2 equivalent for something like black carbon. 
for all the same reasons as methane, but in addition, its climate impacts are highly heterogeneous and are also dependent on where the black carbon is emitted from. So in some ways, calculating a, global, a single global mean value for black carbon CO2 equivalent could be highly misleading. So I wanted to get your comment, first of all, on how you would see black carbon fitting into some of these things, but then also how you evaluate the trade-offs of calculating something like CO2e for black carbon so that it can be included in these baskets against the dangers of creating a value for it that could be quite misleading in terms of what its overall impact is. I think, I think you, you, well, uh, black carbon, changes in black carbon emissions would be treated in the same way that changes in methane emissions would be. But you're absolutely right, our level of understanding of the effect of black carbon is much more volatile. And when you get into very short-lived species, as, as you said, uh, a, a ton of black carbon emitted in one country may not give the same climate impact as a one ton anywhere. Now, I mean, that, that's true of many of the gases actually within the Kyoto Protocol, the very short with HFCs, for example, um, but they're not regarded to be so important to take that into account. But um, I, I, I have no direct answer, and I'm, I'm looking for colleagues maybe to add to this. Black carbon is one of the most complicated things, and also because when you cut black carbon emissions, you almost always are um, cutting co-emitted species, and in fact, in our uh, 2016 paper, we, for, for that reason, we actually lumped organic carbon and black carbon together. Is there one person think that? I totally agree with what uh, Keith said, and um, that carbon can also be seen in the context of sustainable development. And uh, we, I mean, it's getting more and more common to see climate as a part of the SDG challenges. So there are several reasons to address black carbon based on that perspective. Just think on that point, I mean, uh, Mr. Summer might want to comment on the co-benefits of these other forms of pollution reduction, because I know that's something that a lot of countries have included in their NDCs on, on the black carbon pollution. Let me pass. Two questions, but I don't have yeah, hi, Alexander Pfeiffer, my name. I also study at the University of Oxford um, climate change. And so I was a bit fortunate enough to already know the GWP star measure, so I had time to think about it. So what this tells us is basically that um, the amount of, or the sustained rate of methane and other SLCP um, has a huge influence on global warming. And if you go one step further and you look at the IPCC scenarios from the fifth um, assessment report from the database, and you see that in most of the 1.5 to 2 degree scenarios, they actually have a significant impact because the 2,100 levels of methane emissions are much lower mostly than they are today. Um, so what this tells me is basically that most of the carbon budgets we see today and where a lot of policy is based on depends on the assumption of sustained rate of methane emissions and other SLCPs in 2100, which is quite a bit in the future. So it feels like there's a huge sensitivity in the budgets towards this assumption. And I mean, as we saw in this, in this measure, every ton of methane we are off means 2.8 kilotons of CO2 in that, in that budget that we would be off. So my question is, are, are you aware of any efforts that are being made to make these budgets more um, resistant and more more um, robust towards these these assumptions regarding a 2,100 sustained rate of methane emissions. Okay, um, so you're absolutely right. Um, the, these the, the more ambitious we are with CO2, the more it matters um, how other gases are contributing to either um, a reduce, well, they, they will be likely reducing the available carbon budget because they'll still be taking up uh, equivalent carbon budget at the time we actually reach uh, peak warming. Uh, and that payoff is actually going to be the big policy decision we're going to have to make as we approach net zero. And that's why we think this conversation about metrics and how we measure these different gases is so important to have now. Uh, because, and, you know, it, we can't really 
deal with that payoff unless we've got a metric that's fit for purpose to allow us to trade off between these different gases as we approach zero. So um, I, I think you can use these new metrics to actually make that trade-off, to work out how to adjust methane emissions in the future to allow yourself or reduce um, uh, the amount of uh, carbon, to, to allow yourself either more carbon or reduce the amount of carbon you, you, you're allowing yourself to meet a temperature drop. Um, my, my colleagues have noticed um, Frank and the government from Ireland in the back. I wonder whether he's interested in making a comment. <laughs> you, you did have your hand up, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Keith. I actually put my hand up because Jodie had her hand up. <laughs> and uh, I just want to make sure she was seeing so ladies first. Thank you very much. Yes, Jolene, uh, Metrics Geek. Um, <laughs> No, actually, I was going to ask a question. I think it's kind of been answered a, l a little while ago, actually, which is around, obviously, uh, as Jan mentioned, metrics are used for many different purposes, and I think a lot of the conversation that we're having now is about reporting. But obviously, metrics are also used in things uh, you know, by industry or by in emissions trading. Um, and I was just wondering if um, you could share a few thoughts on how um, a metric such as GWP star, which potentially is, it could change annually, um, how, you know, what impact that might have on something like emissions trading schemes. The metric wouldn't change. The volatility of the emissions might increase. <laughs> very academic answer. <laughs> uh, okay, I suppose I, I should say something. No, I, I missed the start, uh, so apologies for that. I, I just think it's a very interesting discussion and something that uh, we will need to take up as, as in the future. Uh, uh, as Adrian has said, we're coming back to this issue in 2019 uh, and there will be new these, these types of analysis will be provided by the IPCC in due course in part of its sixth assessment report. So it's, it's clearly a fascinating uh, discussion to have, and I do think that we will need to have that discussion in, in the not too distant future. As I say, we need, to, we need to consider all of these issues and how best to achieve the balance that is required by the, the Paris Agreement, that Paris Agreement. So, uh, but I would also echo what Adrian said in terms of the systems we have and how we decide in the NDC world where uh, countries make their own contribution. So there, there, there is a, a more bottom-up approach possible, but we'd also need to have that collective approach. So we need to have that discussion about how these things come together so that we can know that our bottom-up approaches that countries are doing will also put us on the collective pathway to, to achieve the, the Paris goals. At the moment, I have one more question. We've been told we're going to need to um, vacate this <laughs> promptly. Um, maybe, yeah. Thanks, uh, Louise Jeffrey from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Uh, a quick point of information that countries have actually been reporting according to AR4 guidelines for about three years now, so some progress. Um, um, my question is actually more about the, the long-term pathways and the balance between sources and sinks. Um, the price agreement didn't happen in the absence of scientific input, and this, this anthropogenic balance between sources and sinks was based on the AR5 report and therefore on the 100 global warming structures. So I guess my question was why then do we need to revisit that um, in terms of trying to understand what it means? Um, and I guess I was, my understanding was that by using the GWP star is that you could then make it seem easier to achieve a balance between sources and sinks. Um, but then my understanding would be it wouldn't actually be easier, just seem easier from what you said. So I was wondering if you could clarify that a little bit and um, maybe explain a bit why um, or why you don't think the Paris Agreement is clear on what it means by that? First of all, the, the Paris Agreement um, does not specify the GWP or any other metric. It says it should be considered. So given that uh, the metric is developing over the years, it's, we don't think it's obvious which metric to use. And as you could see, 
we, in a way, see more than we need. We need really deep negative situations to balance the methane. And, and uh, trading methane and CO2 is really physically very difficult because they are so fundamentally different. CO2 is accumulating as well and is, uh, methane is shortening. And that has been recognized for many years. So when we come to the issue of balance, this issue becomes more critical in our view. And we need to consider that and define it and make it operational. That's our view. And, and, and you know, as an AR5 author, the AR5 absolutely did not say that you need to achieve balance measured by GWP in order to stabilize temperatures, because that would not be true. But that information was then used when trying to insert that in the text into the price agreement. So based, based on the science of the AR5 report, and the AI scenarios, um, that was the basis for formulating the text in the price agreement. Yes, but I mean, perhaps this is a good example of how you know, we need that continuous science policy dialogue that Jan was highlighting. Uh, I don't think, speaking as one of the relevant authors, and I think Jan was another one, um, in the AR5, we didn't really appreciate in writing AR5 that we were going to that our words were going to be used in this way, so to speak. So that's why we need to talk to each other. We can't just generate these reports and assume that the negotiators will make best use of them. We need to have a dialogue. I think that's, that, that's the point here, and that's kind of what this event is all about. When we wrote Chapter 8 in Work Group 1, we didn't think about the balance issue. So the metrics were not addressed or assessed for that purpose at all. But I think we're, we're starting to forget a very healthy science policy debate, but we're going to have to conclude this meeting. Mr. Watson, would you like to did you, you sort of introduce this all by the practical problems that you're facing on this one? Do you want to hear any closing comments after the discussion? Uh, thank you very much. Um, for me, it was a very refreshing um, conversation. Uh, you concluded very well by saying we need a dialogue. Uh, with the English touch on the other side because I think hearing what was presented here and what came from the floor, it's facts that need to be taken into consideration when we do this uh, negotiations. But I feel that one or the other, we are putting them aside a bit and discussing. I don't know if they are a bit or not, but not too much on the, on the facts that are on the table. Um, because I was asking myself a question when we introduced that subject about it, reducing the number of cattle. Uh, coming from a country whereby uh, the, the number of cattle is uh, four times the number of people. And uh, how do you go to that cattle owner and say you reduce your cattle by half when you know very well that you need a capital that with this data in the society is sort of diminished? However, due to what is happening on the ground, I think that there is that need to have that dialogue at all levels so that we understand exactly what we are going to do. Thank you very much.